Hello, my dear brothers and sisters, and welcome to First Love Calvary Chapel. And this is our 9 a.m. live streaming service. And we have a 10 o'clock live one at the church. But um, I'd like to share with you today, the topic is, who did he pair with you? Okay, not your marriage partner, not necessarily a friend, but who did he, the Lord, pair with you? And, and who is he coupled with you? Who did he put you together with to um, do his will, the things that he wants you to do with somebody else? And so in the book of that we're going to read today, the book of Philippians, chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to talk about today is Paul and Timothy. Let's pray and then let's get started. Lord, thank you so much for your word. I pray that you would show my brothers and sisters who you paired them with. And so, Lord, go before us as we study Philippians chapter 1. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Philippians chapter 1, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. Well, a bond servant, Greek word doulos, was someone who was a slave, someone who was subservient to another. In this particular case, it says bond servants, both of these guys, Paul, the older, and Timothy, the younger, they were both having Christ as their head and as their master. And I'll tell you that, you know, sometimes when it comes to the older and it comes to the younger, sometimes the older might expect respect. And, you know, I'm older than you and you should listen to me. And then the younger person, as Paul said about Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. But it's interesting when the Lord couples up an odd couple, you know, two men to serve him that were just such a vast, um, you know, spread between their age. And, and yet, of course, an older person has so much to offer the younger person and the younger person, you know, has so much more energy or enthusiasm. And so, you know, God knows what he's doing when he puts people together. Now, the Apostle Paul, in his letter, he actually mentioned both himself and Timothy. Now, Paul's the one who wrote this. And yet he said, this is coming from me and Timothy to you, the Philippian church. And we are both Christ's servants. We are both brothers. We are both under the lordship of Christ. And Jesus is what our lives are all about. So for Paul to put Timothy, like as the co-laborer right next to his name, in his ministry, it means that Timothy had to have a big part in all this with the Philippians, had to have a big part in Paul's ministry. And so sometimes when you do serve the Lord with somebody, you know, maybe you've done some sort of a outreach of some sort, and, and there was somebody that you worked with, and they just kind of have a place in your heart now. Or you went on a short-term mission trip with somebody and you remember the same, you know, memories together of, of what you did in Christ. And, and so that person has a place in your heart. In the book of Colossians chapter 1, it says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. So we can actually see that it wasn't only to the Philippians, it was also in the book of Colossians that he presents himself. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ but I'm also presenting to you this letter with Timothy, our brother. And then one more is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 1, it says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenes, our brother. Now, Sothenes is only mentioned twice in Scripture. And so, and we don't even know if it's the same guy, but most likely it is. And so it's interesting how Paul sometimes was coupled with Silas or he was coupled with Barnabas. In this case, it mentions um, another time Titus and, and, of course, in today's story, Timothy, and then an unknown brother named Sothony. So sometimes the Lord switches out who you're serving with, kind of like a church. Maybe you see a, a pastor and you see the um, assistant pastors, but maybe somebody moved away, somebody comes and goes, and all of a sudden somebody emerges. And then in that particular situation, you're like going, hey, well, um, pastor, and then this is the assistant pastor, and this is the assistant pastor, but these other guys are, are long gone. And, and so the same thing in the Apostle Paul's ministry. He served with people. The interesting thing, though, in the book of Corinthians, when it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, with Sothenes, our brother, he says, to the church of God, which is in Corinth. And so just like the, it was to the church of Philippi, or it was to the Colossian church, and this one to the church of Corinth, it says, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's interesting, with everybody who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't let anybody tell you the book of Philippians was just for the Philippian church back then. Not that I've ever heard anybody say that, but who knows, watch, you'll bump into somebody this week. And, and that it's for, th these books were written particularly for a church, but the information in these books 
was specifically for all who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you have ever served um, in any capacity, whether it was Sunday school or whether it was the sound ministry or whether it was street ministry or anything, um, you find that those people that you serve with are your co-laborers. They are your fellow soldiers, your fellow servants, the one that you walk to the house of God with. And, and why is that a good thing to have that extra motivating person? Well, kind of like in exercise, right? Or kind of like in taking a hike, that it's nice to have another person along. It's motivating. It's encouraging. You can have some good conversation along the way. If something happens, you're there to help each other. Um, if there's some story to tell, you both know the same story. And so there's a lot of reasons why having another person along with you for the ride is a good thing. And whereas if a person is alone and something happens, you know, maybe nobody's there to protect them. And Jesus did tell his disciples, you know, to bring a couple of swords with them. In other words, there were going to be things that might happen. But as Christians, we're always on a mission together. We're on a mission in this world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But it's not just a one-man job. It's not just like you're going to be able to knock it all out alone. Go ye into all the world with your brothers and sisters. Go ye into all the world with your spiritual leaders, you know, with your church, and preach the gospel to every creature. Band together. Join up with the church of God. Unite your hearts with those that God gives you a love for over time because you've worked with them. Um, so you combine your efforts with their effort and you have a better reward for your labor. God's going to like say, hey, you've got twice as much work done. You're able to do so much more for my kingdom. And, and then also ministry is designed with um, discouragement in it. Not, not that God put the discouragement there, but just the world we live in and the devil that we're fighting. And so there's something about a fellow servant and being able to encourage them when they're down and when they feel like quitting. And so you could see why the Lord believes in the two and that Paul the Apostle was only following a ministry concept that was already taught in Scripture that we're going to look at in just a moment. But I do want to read to you um, a verse from the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And it says in verse 9, it says, Two are better than one. Do you know that? Have you ever experienced that? Do you see that? Or are you that loner? No, I'm single and I just want, don't want a roommate, want to live by myself. No, nah, I don't need to do anything with anybody else at church. I just want to creep into church and creep out. And, and so, yeah, there's some people who are all alone in their mindset. But the Bible says that two are better than one. It says because they have a good reward for their labor. And we all need to be laboring, but it's so much better to labor with somebody else. And it says, for if they fall one will lift up his companion because there are a lot of ups and downs, whether it be with the sinful nature or whether it be how other people have treated you. Um, there can be a lot going on when you're serving God and of course the assaults of the enemy. So therefore that falling down can kind of come in a whole lot of forms and fashions. You know, for myself, um, last September 27th, when I fell under the pomegranate tree and I broke um, my leg mostly toward the angle, ankle, but in three places, I mean, I was alone. Thank God I found my cell phone. And so I was able to get people there quickly. But, you know, I, I think the, the thing is, is um, it, it says if they fall, one will lift up his companion. And thank God for those people who come. Thank God for the, um, the paramedics over here. Thank God for uh, my son, an assistant pastor, and a neighbor that finally came over. And, um, but woe to him who's alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. So that's why the Bible says the two are better than one, because there's a lot that can happen. And, and there's needs that are unpredicted, that just kind of happen, and that but somebody else is there. And I love verse 12, though, of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And it says, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And of course, Jesus had that in his ministry. He revealed himself in that transfiguration on that high mountain to Peter, James, and John. And just like the Lord appeared with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, there is something about that three strands that's not easily broken. And so basically, um, I think um, that that three-strand cord could be you and two other brothers, or you as a sister and two other sisters, and that you're uniting, you're banding together for the cause of the kingdom. Um, maybe the Lord's going to reveal his glory to you along with somebody else that you're fellowshipping with and that he's tied you together to serve him. And that's what the Lord wanted to do. And that story is in Matthew chapter 17, 
where it says in verse 1 and 2 that he transfigured before those three guys. And then also the scripture in Matthew chapter 18, it says the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Just two. It says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. And then he says two or three. And there's just something about Jesus being in our midst. There's something about fellowship. There's something about serving the serving God with somebody else. Just like I mentioned to you about working out. You know, you can have that workout buddy because maybe you get discouraged. Maybe you don't want to go. But it seems like what happens is when you have somebody else, you're trying to please them a little bit like because you don't want to let them down because you said you'd pick them up or you said you'd be there. And so that, that extra you know, buddy system can actually be a blessing. And the concept that Jesus gave, and I want you to look at this up if you do have a Bible with you. It's in Luke chapter 10, and I'm just going to read, um, I think, just maybe verse 1. But verse 1 says this in Luke chapter 10. It says, After these things the Lord appointed 70 others also, and he sent them two by two. It says the Lord sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. As Jesus was about to go to these places and to have his speaking engagement with thousands of people, he would send these coupled up disciples two by two to almost like going into the ark, right? Um, some of the animals were two by two. And, and that he's sending us out two by two to proclaim the way of the Lord, that the Lord's going to be here, the Lord's going to preach, the Lord is coming. And that's the way he did it. So it was, it was, it was a plan. It was, you know, maybe it was a business plan for the kingdom of God. And, and Paul definitely followed it when he was always coupled with somebody else. And even the Holy Spirit in Acts 13 said, send Paul and Silas, send two. Now, at one point early on, at the very beginning of Paul's ministry, he coupled up with a man named Barnabas. Um, that later he had um, a disagreement with that kind of split their unity and hanging out together and you being used by the Lord together. But, you know, and, and there's never too many of us and there's never too many brothers that can come into your life that you could serve the Lord with. If there's if one leaves, there could be another because the harvest is great and the workers are few. And we got to pray that the Lord sends out more labors into the harvest. So it's like, Lord, send me another brother, send me another sister, send me somebody else to work with in this big evangelistic situation to overcome um, the lies of the world and bring the good news of Jesus Christ and to win the world for Jesus and, and, and to fight off all the wolves that would try to come against the plan of God in this world. But when we are coupled up with somebody like Paul was coupled up with Barnabas, it didn't seem like a likely duo, at least to the other disciples at first. And, and sometimes when you're coupled with somebody that you're serving with, maybe it's arbitrarily, Maybe it seems random, but God in his providential plan and will knew that that was his ultimate purpose for you. For instance, um, there was that man, and his, he was called Simon the Cyrenian, and the story says in Matthew 27 that they compelled him, this Simon the Cyrenian guy that was there on the way to Jesus going to the cross, they compelled him to bear his cross. So the Roman soldiers compared this man to bear Jesus's cross. It says, and when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of the skull, when they had come to Golgotha, there was this total stranger who was probably just in Jerusalem to worship from another country, and he was compelled by these Roman soldiers to help carry a part of the cross that Jesus couldn't carry. And even the Apostle Paul said that he was bearing in his body um, he says, I'm filling up in my flesh what was lacking in the death of Christ. And so there's nothing lacking for salvation in the death of Christ. But what he's talking about, what was lacking was the disciples, the people who would go out and spread the gospel about the death of Christ and what the death of Christ meant. And so there was a teaming up. But Jesus didn't say, oh, today, you know, Simon, you're going to come with me and you're going to bear, um, you're going to bear my cross. And, and it was all situations that occurred. The soldiers compelled the man out of nowhere. He's just walking through the crowd and boom, you're carrying the cross. But the Lord does team people up like that. And yet when you look back at it and you see how the Lord did it, it was, it was totally the Lord bringing people together for his plan, for his glory, because two can carry a greater load and two can stir one another up to love and good works, 
that much the more. And so, you know, who are you going to serve with? When I was getting married, the pastor said of my wife, you know, now here's a team for you, Lord. And so while my wife had her being and her breath on this earth until last year, you know what? It was a team for you, Lord. But you know what? Now I have to just keep on going and find other teammates in this whole thing. And I've teamed myself up with Sean. I've teamed myself up with many brothers, many men and sisters at the church for ministry. And, and I, I believe that we're all a team and God adds to that team. And God does the Paul and Silas, the Paul and Timothy, the Paul and Barnabas. He does that. And I will tell you that um, just like God is over all things in the entire universe, and he's working, it says, the Bible says, all things according to the counsel of his will. And things aren't just so specifically by chance as far as that God didn't know about it, and it wasn't part of what God could line up for his ultimate will. And so when you look at the story of Joseph in the Bible, I mean, his brothers didn't want to work with him, did they? They were totally against him. And they took and sold him into slavery. And that was how God, even though it was the brothers doing it, but in the ultimate big picture plan of God, the providential plan of God, that's how God got him to Egypt to save an entire nation from starvation and to preserve God's people. And so that whole teaming up, whether it's Joseph with Pharaoh or whether it's um, Simon the Cyrenian with Jesus Christ or whether it's Paul with Timothy, I mean, here you are, you're going to have all these ministry encounters together. And not all names are always mentioned. I mean, you know, Sothenes, there's no story about him really about him. Um, I mean, there's one particular sentence about him in the Bible, but, but you don't know particularly who he was. Um, and, and maybe, you know, you would just be an honorable mission or that brother would just be an honorable mention, but at least they're mentioned. At least God said, no, this is who you're going to walk to the house of God with. This is who you're going to serve in the house of God with. And, and the kingdom of God is absolutely not a one-man job, just as an army. I mean, you know, the, the Marines or the Navy are not a one-man job. And those people that you march alongside of, those people that you serve with and pray with and cry with and rejoice with, I mean, those people sometimes are interesting people. They're not necessarily who you would choose, but they've added so much to your life. And by the time you're all done, you're family. And, and then when it comes to even serving God and serving God with other people, if you tend to be a loner and you feel like, I don't want to be around other people, who is sufficient for these things? You know, who's equal and can come up to such a task according to 2 Corinthians 2.16? So it says, it, it wasn't a college education that put all the disciples together. It was Jesus calling them to serve side by side in the ministry. And, and at church, you're not just on a ride along. You are in a, like, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You are teaming up with the people that Jesus has teamed you up with. And, you know, you're supposed to encourage each other while it's still called today, lest anybody be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So we're supposed to be in each other's lives to encourage each other for a whole bunch of different reasons. And then you read about Paul with his, the runaway slave Philemon, and, and the door was open for him to serve in ministry because he was a runaway slave. But then Paul was realizing he can't keep on serving with me because he's got to go back to his master. But his master is a Christian now. Maybe his master will give him up for the kingdom of God. And, and so, you know, God provided for a period of time a runaway slave to serve with the Apostle Paul. And we have to team up in order to storm the gates of hell, according to God's word, um, that we can get more done even more quickly. I mean, when we look at the teams that the world puts together, you know, the world's bros, and, um, or as opposed to what we're going to talk about being God's bros, you know, the, the world might call them, oh, you're my frat brother, or you're my um, sorority sister. And, um, or, you know, they even have names like um, Chad's and Brittany's, okay? And, and they make memories together, sometimes great memories for the good, and other times, you know, having led each other astray into some craziness. And, um, but you know what? Even in those evil deeds, there's memories that people have, right? Oh, I remember when we did this, you know? And, um, but, but it's not meant, of course, for anybody just to walk with unwise people and to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, there is a point in time where you've got to want to walk with the wise. And you have to want to be teamed up with those that God puts you with. Um, at one point, the whole world teams up together to create an image of the Antichrist, according to Revelation chapter 13. And it's 
within the verse 14, it says, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. So all of the king's horses and all the king's men, all the intelligent people come together to make an image to set in the temple of God. So if the whole world can come together for the worst, how much better if the whole church, and even if just two people can come together for the better. So I'm going to ask you that question again. Hey, sister. Hey, brother. Who are you teaming up with? Who has God got you just, whether it's even being a pro warrior because you can't leave your house, who has God got you teaming up with? Um, but we do have to watch who we yoke with because if we yoke with the world, we'll be pulled down. But if we yoke with believers, um, we'll be built up. And what is the word yoke? Yoke was a um, particular, um, either a, a piece of wood, sometimes metal, but a bar that would attach the necks and the heads of two oxen <clears throat> that were going to plow a field. And so they were yoked together. They were usually even in size and weight. So one wouldn't pull the other down. And so it would be a, you know, a straight row as far as, um, you know, the, the farming or something. And, and so for all of us, there is, according to um, the scriptures, a, a yoking that takes place, that we have to be careful that we are, um, and I'm trying to find that verse. I guess I'm going to get to, oh, there it is, 2 Corinthians 2.16. Nope, that's not it. Oh, well, okay. So I'll get to that. But the Bible does say to not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And, and so because unbelievers will lead you astray, um, but the Lord will never lead you astray. And by the way, I just, um, right now, in fact, I'm going to do this, see if that, nope, that didn't do anything. Okay, what happened is on my notes right now, I had my notes actually all go into like four pages on my computer. And um, so anyway, so it was a problematic thing. So it put me back all the way to page one. But here it is, 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And so, you know, who would you want to serve with? You know, is it just a friend? Is it a family member? I mean, there are some family members that are totally anointed to be used by the Lord, a mom, a father, a couple of brothers. And, um, you know, God definitely uses families, no doubt about it. Um, another thought uh, that I can have is I kind of scroll past my notes to get what I want to go. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. So the worldly bros and the worldly sisters, you know, it's like there's a time. Yeah, you, you win the loss. You don't pull yourself out of this world and you love on the loss. But as far as yoking together to serve God, that, that only happens with, you know, a Christian brother or a sister because bad company corrupts good morals. But uh, man, Christian company can get a lot done. Um, God will unite your heart for his eternal and everlasting purposes to accomplish them together. A lot of times people look at friendship in just a very self-centered way and what they can get out of it. But we have to look at it in a kingdom-centered way. God puts a common bond of faith between us, of the kingdom's cause between us. We have a common faith, and God builds a trust between us over time as we serve together. And we become those that are working for the progress of others. And we're working for the planting of the Lord as we're, you know, putting ministries together for him and churches together for him. In Titus chapter 1, it says in verse 4, or yeah, verse 4, Titus, a true son in our common faith, and saying that the, the faith binds us together. And so there's different ways you can double up. Paul called Titus a son, but maybe it is your marriage. Maybe it is your parents or an old friend, but it's who the Lord has joined together and what God has joined together. Um, let no man divide it up, right? And, and what happens is you remember those that you went to Bible school with or the school of hard knocks with. You remember your um, buddy in arms and your buddy in the, in the you know, foxhole. You remember um, that war that you both went through together. Like we'll just say on the physical level, Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, Kuwait, any of those past situations. But in spiritual warfare, you know, you never forget those that stood by your side and they fought with you. They hung in there with you. And, and even if there's nobody with you, my brothers and sisters, the Lord stands with you. So you've got a majority right there. Philippians chapter 2, in verse 20, it says, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own and not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know the proof of him that as a son with his father he had served with me in the gospel. Talking about Timothy. 
that nobody was like-minded with Paul except for Timothy. And he served in the gospel with Paul. And people were just seeking their own thing. They weren't seeking to be used by the Lord. Imagine the early church. People are just like today, aren't they? It says that they were seeking their own. And, and Paul, when he thinks of the, Corinth, uh, the, the Philippian church, because we're on Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, um, he had a lot of love for the body of Christ. And so basically, we have to be like John the Revelator, who was a, an apostle and a disciple of Jesus, and he was at the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper, hearing his heartbeat. We have to be close to the brethren and have a familiarity, a family feeling with the brethren. Paul said about the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. He was remembering God's people. And also, Philippians chapter 1, verse 8, it says, How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Imagine loving a brother or a sister in the church so much that you feel affection in your heart. I was seeing today um, Pastor Sean's little baby girl, and she lit up when she saw me and she just started smiling. And it's because she already recognized me. And I'm, you know, do my little cutesy little baby, you know, stuff toward her. Um, but it was, it was kind of nice to see already an affection of a baby towards you when you want to know them and, and they're recognizing you and getting to know you. Now, of course, um, my grandkids live in another state. I want that to be the same with them as well. Um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, are their brothers and sisters in your church, and especially in your church, not from your old church, not from all of your old churches, but in your churches, their brother and sister that you are, you get to church, like, oh, I'm so happy to see you. It doesn't mean you have to go back to your old church, but you need to build, start building some relationships in the church that you're in. Um, the body was in the heart of Paul, the body of Christ, the people of God. And, and when he wrote the letter in Philippians chapter 1, he said that we are bond servants of Jesus Christ, and this is to the church in Philippi, and also to the bishops and deacons. So there's a greeting to all of them. There was um, a connection and a family, church, Holy Spirit, family connection with everybody. And that's what Paul presented. He had a huge heart. He always carried the churches in his heart as a burden. And I'm wondering, is there anybody that you're carrying good things with? Is there any place where, where the body of Christ is a burden on your heart? Paul says in Philippians 1, 7, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. Do you have a Timothy in your heart? Do you have a Phoebe in your heart? Do you have a Priscilla in your heart, an Aquila in your heart? Do you have a Titus in your heart? God puts these brethren in your heart. And you can be committed together to the cause of Christ. Together you can be committed to the good news and you're accountable to one another in this. You're showing consistency and working with one another in this not wanting to let each other down. Sometimes even a friendly competition. There was a event, maybe it was last Easter. I was handing out flyers with Pastor Sean, and he was on the other side of the street, and he went way ahead of me. I mean, you know, I don't know if he's like just faster than me or he's trying to hand out more flyers, but those are healthy competitions for the kingdom of God. Um, and, and, and when you're with somebody else, sometimes you might be more adventurous and do something that had you been alone, you might not have done, but because you're with somebody else, you're more adventurous. And so the, Jesus has a reason why he sent them out two by two. And, and sometimes when you're alone, or sometimes you are alone because others have fled from you, that friendship is long gone. That brother in Christ and sister in Christ you served with is long gone. You couldn't straight, straighten out your differences. But as the um, old Indian um, worship song goes, though none go with me, still I will follow. And you got to say that, though none go with me, still I will follow. E Elijah the prophet felt very alone. And he was sure he was alone. And God had to remind him that there's others that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. And, and the, this particular brother, Barnabas, who is kind of the co-minister, companion, anchor with Paul. I'll tell you a little bit about his story in just a minute. But when I, I mention the word anchor, and if you men see an anchor that goes down, it has this part of the anchor and... That, that other part of the anchor. And, and so you and I are each part of the anchor for the kingdom of God and for each other's lives. And, and what Barnabas did is he pulled 
Paul to the other apostles who really didn't want anything to do with Paul. But he was able to rally them in to realize that Paul was really saved. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, it says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him because, you know, he was putting people in prison, right? It says, And they didn't believe that he was a disciple, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And so look at what a brother can do in your life for God. And then 2 Corinthians 8, 23, If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Can you say that about somebody? They are my partner in Christ for the work of the gospel. They are my fellow worker in Christ for the work of God, for loving the children in church, for going out into all the world. That's who it is. And, um, you know, maybe there's a brother, Timothy. Maybe there's a sister, Imelda, a sister, Marta, a sister, Nordina. Maybe there's a sister, Mary. Um, there's a sister, Cynthia. And um, specifically with the last name, Ruelas. Um, do you have a brother or a sister in your heart and somebody who is part of the kingdom of God that you can serve alongside of? Um, the thing about Paul is he knew Timothy's background, history, that he had grown up in the scriptures. He knew his, who his father was. He knew that his, his mother, it says in 2 Timothy 1.5, um, that the faith that was first in your grandmother Lois and also your mother Eunice. So there's something, familia, that happens in the body of Christ. There is something where it's not just I served with that person, but I know that person. I've gotten to know how that person ticks. And, and then Jesus said, you know, for, to all the crowds that were following him, even about his own human family, he said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then he stretched his hand toward the disciples. That's in Matthew 12, 48 and 49. He says, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and uh, is my brother and sister and mother. So there we go. That God brings family in the body of Christ. And Paul says to Timothy, you carefully followed my doctrine. And that's what happens. We hang around each other. And we're able to follow each other. We're able to know and be on the same page and know the, the spirit of that person. You're able to contextualize that person when come, somebody comes along and says, oh, you know, that person and don't believe that person. And, um, but you know they're wrong um, because you know that friend in the context of what they're saying about them and what they said. And you've developed memories with that person. You've seen that person's walk with the Lord. You've seen their works. And, um, and, and you know that you've got that same spiritual DNA from the Holy Spirit. And, and so God will bring a lifetime of Timothys into your life to say Paul and Timothy. Not trusting in the arm of flesh because people can let you down, even Timothys sometimes. There was a story of that's what created the contention between Barnabas and, and Paul is his nephew, John Mark, and they had a little three-way ministry thing going, and, and then John Mark went back and didn't continue in the ministry with them. And, and ultimately, it's the Lord we trust in. Man isn't always trustworthy, but we do have to also grow in our ministries to trust our brother. It doesn't always go perfectly, like in the case with Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. Sometimes there are misunderstandings, and brothers go their separate ways, and this brother took John Mark with him. But ultimately, Paul said, I find John Mark useful in ministry. And so people's hearts change. Situations and time, you know, heals things. Um, there's a scripture in Philippians 2.20. And it was one I already read, but I read it from the, another translation. But it says, I have no man like-minded. No man like-minded. Sometimes you, you wonder, like, gosh, is there anybody that thinks like me? Is there anybody that wants to serve like me? Is there any, you know, and there are. He says, except for Timothy. There is the except for Timothy. Um, to join your name with another brother or another sister. To not just go on that hike with, but to witness on that hike. To step out of your comfort zone and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and do you hear a brother after church calling you and say, hey, come, let's, let's eat a meal together. Let's break bread together. Oh, no, you know, I, I've got something to do. I've got to go water my lawn or, or something. 
vain, not vain, but um, what's the word? Um, it's like a, a word of like a measly excuse, you know? It's like, come on, let's not, not make excuses like that. Um, that brother that you're saying no to might be more significant in your life and in the spiritual timing of your life right now than your earthly brother or sister is. And, and through walking with them and, and just breaking bread with them, according to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, 16, it says, I urged Titus and sent our brother with him. And did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? God can cause us to have the same heart, the same spirit, the same steps. And, and to get in step, to get in harmony, to walk agreed. Amos 3, 3, can two walk agreed unless, can two walk together unless they're agreed. And you know what? The Holy Spirit and the Word of God puts us in agreement. We have the same calling. We all have the same work and we're not to be tearing our brother down. We're not to be like the prodigal brother of the prodigal. That this guy was um, just really mad of the celebration that was going on for his brother that had been away and had come back home. And so sometimes um, there are brothers and sisters in Christ and in church that don't know how to walk with each other. Um, you know, the disciples fought, who's going to sit on your right hand and your left? And then there's sometimes a brother or sister will watch everything you do and they just judge you for everything. But then you have to be happy when you see that a brother or sister is being used by the Lord, that you're rejoicing with them, that they're being a success for God. And, and, and that you're, you're cheering them on rather than, um, well, I know how you really think and I know how you really are or whatever. You know, just people change, people grow, get people, you know, room to be used by God. Galatians 5.13, it says, Through love, serve one another. Hey, Cain murdered his brother Abel. Don't have a murderous heart. Um, we are our brother's keeper. So don't become angry and envious. And, you know, David has, you know, conquered his ten thousands, but only Solomon is thousands. So, uh, not Solomon, but um, Saul. And so he, Saul becomes very angry then because of what they're saying. Don't let a root of bitterness get into your heart towards your brother or your sister. Love them. Serve in love for one another. Get yourself in gear with this whole thing. And, and be there for your brother, either to confess your faults or to, for him to confess his faults, likewise with sisters, um, and to pray together. Don't be like a, a basketball player that's a ball hog and has to make all the shots, but be a team player passing the ball. Don't be the standoffish one, you know, um, at church, we're in the locker room, you know, um, that the Bible says that you would put your brother's or your sister's interest above yourself. It says in Philippians, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so sometimes people just get all into their own, like I'm over here at church, I'm over here on the team. And no, we are a team and we serve together. And even Jesus himself was not ashamed to call us brothers. It says in Hebrews chapter two, or verse 11, it says, at the end of verse 11 in the New International Version, it says, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. And then um, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, love as brothers. And so there is something about the team and the team effort, and I'm doing this one for the team. And then some people get all caught up and like, well, I can't serve with a woman because I'm a man and, you know, and all these things. And my wife gets mad. And, and yeah, there have been many a wife that... Um, you know, have held their husband back from ministry because that sister can't be a part of that ministry. And believe me, I've heard that. And, um, but you know, Jesus, when he's talking to the woman at the well in John chapter four, verse 27, he says, and at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, um, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? Like, why are you talking with a woman? So Jesus kind of broke the whole mold. And so there is no invisible boundaries that sometimes churches create. Yes, people do have to, you know, watch themselves to not stumble themselves, but not so overly watching themselves that they can't serve alongside somebody else, that you can't just be a Christian with Christians. And in Romans chapter um, 16, verse 1, it says, I commend you to Phoebe, our sister, who's a servant of the church in Centria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. I want you to assist your sister. That's brothers. Brothers, everybody assists this girl. She's an awesome servant of Christ. Peter and John ran to the tomb after Jesus was resurrected, almost intuitively. Um, so there we go. We're working together. 
all the way to um, seeing the resurrection. And, and if God brings about a change because he takes out this person and puts in that person next to you or something like that, just trust God and, and go with it throughout the years. Um, it's sad when that happens because it says that a brother offended in Proverbs 18, 19 is harder to win than a strong city. And, and sometimes when brothers do have contention against one another, it's so beautiful, though, when brothers dwell, dwell together in unity and they're able to get things straightened out between them and they can serve together once again. And um, so just like in your car, you might have to press the pairing button to get your Bluetooth working with your phone. God is saying, press the pairing button today. The Holy Spirit can pair all ages and all kinds of men and women together for his purposes. So who does God have me to work with and to run with and to serve with? doesn't mean you're going to become cliquish and we're going to have our own little group here in church, but to know brothers and sisters that would be willing to lay down their lives for Christ. Wow. That are willing to put in their effort, their money, their creativity, a willingness to work long hours together for Jesus. And we've seen that in different events in our church. And then those people are going to have a grand entrance. We're not talking about salvation not being by the blood of Christ. But we're talking, maybe it has to do with rewards, but they're going to have some sort of a grand entrance that others don't have into the everlasting kingdom. Yeah, saved by grace, but grand entrance. Um, and, and so it says in 2 Peter, that thing about a grand entrance, about growing in the Lord, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, and it says in verse 11, so it says, For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you are, you know, walking with that large heart, for God and with, with the brethren. All right, so that's where um, I just wanted to go to right now on this study. And so um, may the Lord have blessed you with it. Um, I actually um, had taught this particular one at the 10 o'clock service last week at um, First Love Calvary Chapel. Um, today at 10 o'clock, there is a brother teaching, which I told everybody last week. His name is Frank Mayorga. And he is um, going to be sharing the Word of God this morning. So if you can get there and you want to get a second message and a second dose for the Lord, um, you know, get over to First Love Calvary Chapel in Whittier. Um, and that means drive all the way from North Carolina or Illinois. No, I'm just kidding. But um, anyway, God bless you guys. And um, may the grace and peace of God go with you. And if you need to ask Christ in your heart, rededicate your life to Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for you and rose again from the dead. And you shall be saved. Have a great day.